felt myself as as the baby that was in the crib and I felt myself detaching from my body from the crib and the next thing I knew I was literally literally up on the ceiling looking down at everybody and um at that moment the, the things just kind of faded out like like everything just went kind of dark for a moment and the next thing I knew it I was everything lit back up again and I wasn't in the hospital anymore I was now deep in the light and I remember that there were there were a, just a cluster of beings um, in front of me and there were like three or four of them that were there now and by the way I, I should tell you that that this cluster wasn't just one little cluster it was like a sea that went on forever and ever and ever and and as far as I could see that cluster, that last being that was way out there in the middle, I mean, way, way out there, okay? I knew that being, I knew that being less, and I knew what that life of that being was, all the lives that that being had had, and that being knew me. I, it was as intimate as the ones that were standing in front of me. I still had my own individual aspect of consciousness of who I was, but I was no longer a physical being. I became a light being, integrated with everybody. And, um, and it, it was it was extraordinary, and I wanted to stay there forever. This is Beyond with Heather Tash, where we examine near-death experiences and life itself, hopefully making this life a little better. Hello, everybody. Welcome. I am so excited about my guest today. Welcome to you, Franco Romero. Hi, Heather. How are you? Good to see you. It was nice chatting with you before we got on. I know it was really interesting chatting with you before we got on. You um, are really a source of wisdom, and I know you're going to share some of that with my audience today. Very excited but, to do that. Yeah, me too. Um, I know we're going to talk about some future things, but right now what I want to start with is your near-death experience because you had a pretty incredible one and in all the circumstances surrounding it yeah. when you were just a baby. Yeah, which makes it a little bit more unique. I mean, every near-death experience is unique, okay? Right. Um, but mine, um, I guess, um, kind of falls into that somewhat different category because because you're right. I had it when I was, I, I had my near-death experience when I was six months old. And so right there and then somebody could say, well, what, and then how do you know anything? <laughs> what happened here? Um, but if I, when I explain it a little further, it, it makes a little bit more sense. Um, I didn't know I had a near-death experience at six months. Um, not, not at all. I lived for a good chunk of my childhood life and early teenage life just doing what other people were doing, sort of, because I did live in a house that was haunted for six years. I call it the hauntings. Um, but that's for a whole other topic. But, um, but I basically didn't know I had a near-death experience. And it wasn't until about the age of 15 that I actually started to have dreams and visions of um, of that event. And, and then I said of that event because I was just, I thought I was just having dreams, you know. But the thing was is that I was having them pretty continuously. And I would have these visions of that same dream pretty continuously for, it probably went for several months. And and it was at that time that I decided to, to approach my, my mother um, who was in this vision, who were always who was always in these dreams. And I said, look, I'm having these um, wild dreams about about having, at first I thought I was just in a hospital room watching somebody dying, but then it became pretty obvious to me that I was the one dying and that that one that was dying was an infant who was, that was six months at the time. And that, um, and that the experiences that I had of that in and of itself was pretty wild. But then what happened was is that I, I would have these uh, these sort of complementary visions and dreams that allowed me to see what happened to the child, um, me, <laughs> uh, because again, this was such a different, two different events happening, right? Fifteen years later, uh, it, it it took a long time for me to 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 know myself as that child that was in the in that experience. But in any event, I started to um, have visions and dreams about what happened when when I crossed over, and so. There are a number of things that I, I could tell you about in the in the near death about what happened in the hospital and how nobody knew of any of this other than my mother. 
um, and that she eventually validated that. And then there's the whole thing about what happened when I when I went into the light and how that transformed me going forward in terms of the psychic clairvoyant abilities that I that I now have. So um, so should I just dive right in and tell you my 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 story? <laughs> yes, dive right in. It really is, as I said, a fascinating one. So, so when I was, um, as I said, when I was six months old, I, um, I, my family at the time was, was, uh, living in South America and Colombia. And, um, my mother, um, was, um, my father had, a, had already moved up here to take a job up here in, in the States. And, um, and so my mom was by herself, although she had a family support system and whatnot. Um, and I was uh, just a baby and I was having complications, breathing, uh, coughing and whatnot. And so she took me to the nearest hospital, uh, which was kind of like a clinic slash hospital setting. And, um, and she just wanted to make sure that everything was okay because I wasn't getting any better and it was kind of hitting me pretty fast. And so the doctors kind of suspected that it wasn't just your typical cold or maybe flu-like symptoms, but that there was something more happening. So they, so they, had, they had told her that they wanted to keep me uh, there for observation overnight. And it wasn't very long after I was admitted that it became pretty obvious that I was getting worse and really fast. Um, Apparently, like within three or four hours tops, my my body had turned for the worse. My my body was shutting down. My organs were shutting down. It was getting pretty significant. And the doctors um, realized that I wasn't going to make it through the night. And so they they um, went into the uh, the hospital room. And and so I'm telling you this story now from the perspective of me seeing all of this. Okay. Um, the, the first little pit, tidbit of it, I was just something that I pieced together with my mom. But but where I jumped into the story was where I saw the hospital room. I was standing next to my mother who was laying in on this bed. She was sort of laying. She wasn't a patient or anything, but she was just laying on this bed. Um, and there was a little incubator type of contraption in one end of the room. And there were several other people there, my aunt and a couple other women who Later on, I was told were like um, the neighbors who brought my mom to the hospital, and um, and I remember feeling ex like I felt the room, the energy of the room, but I really felt this um, connection with my mom more so than I did in any dream I would have had. I, I really felt like I could tap into what she was feeling and what she was thinking in that moment, and so. Um, when the doctors came in, they asked her to come out and, and they, they basically told her. Um, and at that point I was, I remember I was standing behind her, but again, nobody could see me I, and whatnot, but I was, I was standing behind her and they were telling her that, <clears throat> that uh, if I was lucky, I'd have a few hours to live and that they were really requesting that she try to get all the family that she could um, there to the hospital. Um, and that, and that if it were, if it was okay with with her that they would like to bring in the uh, the chaplain or the minister in the hospital to to perform the last rites for me and since my mom was a a, a serious um, Catholic woman and, um, she she said of course but she was really I remember how she was feeling into and she was the moment that they told her that I had just a few hours to live everything kind of went blank for her um, she could hear what they were saying. And she was acknowledging what they were saying, but she was totally lost in in her world, uh, as anyone would be when they hear that kind of news. And um, so they went off, and and she went back into her room. And I remember um, that my aunt came up to her. My my mother was like stone cold white, and you know, with showing no emotions. But she she went back to where she was going to sit, and instead of sitting down um, on that bed, she picked up. Her, uh, her purse, uh, which was just a, like a little tiny little purse, and she proceeded to, um, to leave the room. And, and um, I suspect that the people in the room thought she was just going to step out for something like fresh air or whatever, but she, she was in a very hypnotic state. I mean, she just completely disconnected out of that whole experience. And, um, and instead, she went out of the hospital room and she 
um, she went to a nearby church. Uh, it wasn't very far away. When she got to about a block away, she got on her knees and um, instinctively just decided to crawl all the way to to the church, uh, up the stairs, on her knees, to the to the front of the of the altar, and began to to pray. Um, and um, and and what was really fascinating about that experience was that um, when I was in the in the church with her, I could feel that everything in the church was was sort of centered around her emotions, her energy. It was everything. It, it was so thick in terms of the emotional energy she was releasing. But what was also really interesting at the time, I understand it now, but at the time I was really um, just kind of looking at her and, and kind of confused because she wasn't she wasn't hysterically sad um, like some parent would be, uh, obviously, in this situation. Instead, she was she she had this incredible sense of being so aware of of something about her that was more filled with gratitude and and joy and appreciation which is a kind of an odd combination uh, for that moment because all i could see and feel into as she was praying was that she she was so so happy to have had me in her life for a short period of time she was giving thanks um, and appreciation for every single moment that she had, even this moment, even though she knew that she was losing me and, and she was there in the church instead of back in the hospital room. There was this incredible sense of, of gratitude, um, regardless. And, and that to me was at first wasn't really connecting with me because I couldn't understand that feeling. In any event, um, as she as she was sitting there in the altar, she she kept doing this kind of mantra like prayer of gratitude and appreciation. And at some point in that whole thing, the air, the energy in the air in that in that church uh, shifted, and the, and and all of a sudden, I I felt into so I could at that point I was just listening to her. I was still not as connected with her as I became here in the moment. I was just feeling into and listening to her prayer and, and, and feeling into her emotions. But then when the air shifted, I, I, I felt like I had connected with her even deeper where I started to actually visualize what she was starting to see. And what she was starting to see was this imagery that, that just popped up um, that started to show her what my life would have been had I had I lived to be older. So she got to see me growing up. She got to see me becoming a young man, uh, becoming a father, a husband, um, a good person to people, whatever. You know, she got to see all that. And she was, her face was just full of tears because to, for her, this was like she got a chance to, to experience me, even though she wouldn't have that chance here. Um, she got to see the whole picture of my whole life. And I know, I remember that she was in, in such in such a beautiful, happy state of, of, of gratitude, again, big thing, gratitude, that um, all she kept saying was, thank you, thank you, thank you for letting me see this. Thank you for letting me see this. Um, and eventually, it didn't take very long before that, that imagery kind of faded away. But as it was fading away, the, the energy shifted again in the church. And it became super light. And and she felt super light. And in fact, she just stopped crying. It was like, you know, she just kind of got herself together and everything felt good. And she felt at peace. I could feel her peace. And she got up. She went out of the church. She walked back to the hospital. And when she got to the hospital, there were all these people who were waiting for her. And they, the doctors, the nurses, family members, and and there was quite a bit of a small group gathering there. I can remember seeing them. And, and the doctor came out of that group and he went up to her and she was expecting, because he had tears in, you know, running down in his face. And she was expecting him to, to tell her the news that I was gone. And instead, he, um, he said, I don't know what happened, but in the short period of time that you were gone, um, your, your, your son's vitals came back. His organs started to come back. Everything started to come back. He's literally, literally almost as if he didn't even have anything now, but we're going to still keep him for another day. But he literally came back from the dead. 
and as most doctors would <laughs> these days still they all they just wrote it off as one of these unexplainable medical miracles and they were so overjoyed by just the fact that i this miraculous you know coming back from the dead thing that they just wrote it off that way she didn't care she had me back she took me home and the story my story my vision of that ended there and then the other part of the vision is what picked up from from not there but what was happening at the hospital while she was in the church and that was that i i had image images of myself and she had walked out to do what she was going to do in the church and i stayed behind and i and i went to the incubator crib whatever it was that was that had me there laying and i felt a strong attachment to myself and in literally what felt like just an instant integration i all of a sudden felt myself as as the baby that was in the crib and i felt myself detaching from my body from the crib and the next thing i knew i was literally literally up on the ceiling looking down at everybody and um at that moment the, the things just kind of faded out like like everything just went kind of dark for a moment and the next thing i knew it i was everything lit back up again and i wasn't in the hospital anymore i was I was of all places, and, and this took me a while to figure out too, and it has a little bit to do with what we were talking about before before you and I got on this interview. Um, I found myself in a desert, and I was going, what, what am I doing in a desert? And I was hovering above the desert, okay? Not really, really way up, but just enough. And there were all these people down below me, uh, let's say maybe, maybe like 20 feet up or two stories up or so, okay? And they're all looking at me, as if, you know, like, of course, I'm floating up in the air. And so, of course, they'd be looking at me. But I didn't understand any of this. Um, and then I realized I was really fixated on this on this one particular older man who, who um, he looked very, um, for lack of better words, he looked a little bit decrepit. He looked like he was, like, starving and hungry, and, like, hungry, starving and poor and just really, like, really bad. And so he had his hand out and he was pointing it up to me and i didn't understand what that was all about other than you know like when somebody puts their hand out for like a, you know like money or something you know can you give help me out um but i didn't really understand that but what i realized at that moment of shortly after that was just that he wasn't looking at me he was looking through me and i realized that he was looking at something behind me and when i turned to see what it was was this amazingly beautiful orb um, it was, it was the kind of what you hear people talk about. It was this, it was like a sun. Okay. But it was so big. It was so huge. I mean, it was like, take, take our sun and, and multiply it by at least 10, maybe 20 times at least. And that probably, it was huge. And I remember that I, I didn't feel, I was looking at it and that the first thing I thought was, well, it's that big. I should be like frying. I should be like super like frying. Okay. And I also thought the other thought that I had was why, why can I, why is it that I can see into the light? I mean, I, I couldn't understand, you know, you go and you look at the sun. Okay. And you have to go, <laughs> you know, and then you have that little blotchy image of the sun afterwards that you have to deal with. It, it wasn't like that. It was beautiful. It was like, I could look at it all day long. It was so warm. Okay. And uh, when I went back to look at it, the old man had turned into this little boy, same kind of situation, just hungry, you know, looking for something and um, looking for nourishment. And um, and then I look back and now this sun was like right above me. It was like ready to just engulf me. And when I um, and when I allowed it, when I allowed myself to drift into it, um, it was. It, I, I described this in my book a lot. Um, it, it's, it was the most extraordinary feeling that I could ever. There, so Heather, I, it took me a long time to figure out how to describe this feeling because because I know that other people who have had near death experiences also um, have a challenge in trying to put it into three D words. Okay, and and so in my book I talk about it being like a million hugs. Which up until up until not too long ago, it was the best way that I could describe it because I love hugging. I'm a hugging person, and so I figured, okay, it's a million hugs. <laughs> that's that's got to be really good. Um, but what I've what I've come to realize more and more as I've been 
sort of expanding into this other realm of my the gifts sort of speak the things that i came back with is that it's not it wasn't a million hugs it was even greater than that and the best way to describe it all right is imagine so your body has 50 trillion cells okay roughly give or take all right and um imagine all 50 trillion cells of your body remembering itself as who they are and getting flooded with this energy that goes through each and every one of them as individual cells okay and all of them becoming aware of themselves in in a way that each and every one of those cells was experiencing an orgasm. And so it was like experiencing 50 trillion orgasms at a bare minimum. What I would call, what other people would call a state of pure ecstasy, pure, pure ecstasy. But the best way to describe it is imagine having an orgasm and multiplying it by at least 50 trillion. And you probably get somewhat in the vicinity of what this felt like. Okay. And then it went on. That's the other thing. It didn't just stop. Okay. Like what we have orgasms. We went on forever and ever. It was like, who wants to come back if they're feeling like that all the time? It was amazing. It was absolutely amazing. So in any event, um, when that, I call that now an integration, when we become, become integrated into, into oneness. Um, when that happened, um, I, I, um, I remember that I was standing in this, in the, I was now deep in the light. And I remember that there were, there were just a cluster of beings, um, in front of me. And there were like three or four of them that were there. Now, and by the way, I, I should tell you that, that this cluster wasn't just one little cluster. It was like a sea that went on forever and ever and ever. And, and as far as I could see that cluster, that last being that was way out there in the, I mean, way, way out there. Okay. I knew that being, I knew that being less, and I knew what that life of that being was, all the lives that that being had had. And that being knew me, I, it was as intimate as the ones that were standing in front of me. And, um, and the ones that were standing in front of me came, came up to me and I knew them. I knew them from way, 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 way beyond this world, way, way, way beyond this world. Um, I know that a lot of other people talk about how they're reunited with family members here, and there is some aspect to that, okay? A lot of that is, there is that. But I, I, my connection with these beings were way beyond a life that existed here. Um, the, these were my, my family, these were my, my true genuine soul group, my soul mates. Um, they were, they were home to me. Okay. And so, so I, they didn't have faces. They were like silhouettes, like white silhouettes. Okay. They didn't, they didn't, but I knew them. I, I could, I could make them out in a group of 50 trillion, gazillion, babillion. I'm making up these numbers, but you know, that's just me, you know, kind of emphasizing how many beings there were. I could make them out in the, in the, in, in the middle of all that. I would be able to make them up because everything was telepathic. Everything was emotional. There was what we call energetic signature frequencies that connected us together. And so, um, so I remember that they, they came up to me and, and they, then they gave me their hugs and I exploded again. I mean, it was like, I thought I was already in, in ecstasy. Now I was really gone. I was like really gone. Any, any, sense of myself as a physical being went out the door at that point. I mean, I had already in the first blast of this light, I had already lost that sense anyway, but anything that was remotely left for me to imagine myself as who I was in a physical way was gone. I still had my own individual aspect of consciousness of who I was, but I was no longer a physical being. I became a light being integrated with everybody. And, um, and it, it was it was extraordinary, and I wanted to stay there forever. And I did get the chance to stay there for a while and visit other spaces. But while I was in that particular space of light, um, I remember feeling this. Um, there was there was this feeling that I was being guided through this process in some way, and there was this sense that there was something that was always kind of just behind me, kind of showing me around without necessarily having to tell me where to go. And, um, and at that moment, I heard this voice that said, um, said, what do you see? 
and I was like, uh, <laughs> to be honest, the first couple of times that they asked, I was like, uh, <laughs> I see a lot of, a lot of, a lot of lights here, a lot of beings here. But I wasn't saying that, and I wasn't being sarcastic, but, uh, but looking back at it, that was sort of the, 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 the reaction I had was, what are you asking? I mean, it, what do you see? It's an ocean of, of, of beautiful beings that are sharing their light, and it feels like, like this huge ecstasy experience everybody was having. And they kept insisting that I kept describing what I would see. And I was a little bit, I wouldn't say annoyed, but I was really distracted. They were distracting me because I just wanted to hang out and be in this space. I just didn't care to remember what it was that they wanted me to remember. And, um, and then eventually I, I, I looked up and I had looked up already many times already, but I looked around and I started to really feel into everything that was there, every being there, every experience there. I just started feeling into everything and then it hit me. It hit me, and the moment that it hit me, I felt something along the lines of a hand that went on my shoulder, my right shoulder, and I got whisked back. And the next thing I knew, I was going through a tunnel, which I didn't remember really experiencing that tunnel effect going forward, but I because the tunnel to me was this big bright light that kind of just came up on me all of a sudden. But in this case, I did. I was just flying back. I was just flying, flying back through this tunnel and um next thing i know i um i come crashing into my body and and unlike other near death experiences where this is one time instance where it happens i kept repeating this dream for months <laughs> and these visions for months and so um and each time i came back same reaction i looked around and i started to cry i started to cry because i this I realized that this wasn't this wasn't home. This wasn't real, and um, but I didn't have a way to really explain that. I there was you know back then there wasn't anyone that you could turn to and talk to you without without running the high risk of being medicated and institutionalized. Okay, so uh, no, <laughs> that wasn't going to happen. So um, and and part of it is because something like that happened to one of my siblings when we were in the hauntings. Um, so, yeah, okay, so I'm going to, that happens in the hauntings and I'm going to tell them that I just had an, an experience where I remember my death 15 years ago. Nobody would care that I knew the details of that death in a way that very few people, only my mother knew the part of the, of the near death experience that had to do with her. And she said, she swore she had never short, shared that with anybody, not the prayers and stuff that she did in, or the meditative prayers, if you want to call it, cause they weren't really prayers in the church. Nobody knew that stuff. Only I did. And so, and so, um, I wasn't going to do that. So she, she, um, she told me to share this with everybody. Uh, you know, this, you know, she thought she was, oh, I thought that, you know, you coming back, you know, from being dead was, was a big deal, but you remember all this stuff, all this stuff. It's a miracle. You know, you got to tell everybody. I said, I know. <laughs> I'm not going to tell anybody. Sorry. <laughs> that ain't going to happen. All right. Um, and I kept it. I kept it to myself for for a long time, for a long, long time, and and I, I I chronicle a little bit of that in in the first part of my book to kind of help people. Um, they didn't have to have near death experiences, and in, the, in the, all of the stuff that I do now, and the, the teaching and the stuff that I do now, I I I I play with a lot of people that have had spiritually transformative experiences that have been equally profound um, for them that have opened up their eyes and their minds and their consciousness to all sorts of things. But, um, but I, I held this for a long, long time because I wanted to keep it normal. <laughs> and then, you know, what's normal these days, right? So, um, so, but it was, a, it was really a tough thing because as I was getting older, um, I, my clairvoyant abilities were getting stronger and stronger and stronger. And so, to the point where I started seeing, you know, prophetic things, things about the the future of humanity and 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 about consciousness and about us and all sorts of things that took me a while to to allow myself to accept them, um, and then then to figure out how I was going to bring it out to, to people and share it with them. So so yeah. that's that's basically my my story. Now I will tell you one last thing. What did I see? Uh, what was it that I saw that was so profound that 
that um, that at the moment I realized that I, I was like party over, you're going back now. Okay, party over, you're going back because you're going to someday have to share this with everybody. Okay, and, and that's the other thing that a lot of near death experiencers um, they they know they come back and they and they're they're told they're coming back and for many of them I'm, I don't want to speak for all of them um, be, but for many of them what they don't realize is that they're coming back yes because they have some unfinished business but what they don't realize is that what their unfinished business is going to be as 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 frequencies consciousness rises in this planet they're going to remember more and more of their near-death experience. They're going to remember things that they didn't come back with to share yet. But when it was going to be time, they were going to share more about not only their experiences on the other side, but things that have absolutely huge relevance to why they came back to share the story of who we truly are and, and why we're truly here and why now. And I do a fair, I, I did some, some teaching with the International um, Association of Near-Death Studies um, earlier this year, and I had a chance to meet with a lot of near-death experiencers. And, and as we talked through a lot of this, they were like, whoa, you're right. <laughs> There's more to my story than even I remember. I said, it's just because your frequencies haven't activated the remembrances of that yet, but it will come. They came back to be messengers, not just the why or what happens when we die. They came back to be messengers as to who we really are and why now. So, so um, that was part one. The other part two of that <laughs> was that I realized uh, the reason that I came back and what I saw was a, a profound difference in something that has been taught to us since day one. And we kind of touched upon this a little bit before we, we went on in the interview was that um, what I saw was an, a sea of, of individual beings inside this beautiful, beautiful light. And what I, what I realized was that the light, the light itself that we would refer to as oneness, source, God, creator, whatever, that, one, that light was created by the beings. The beings were not created by the light. And that's a fundamental contrast in the way that we have been taught to believe in terms of our relationship to ourselves and with whatever you call God. We created the source. That's why we are gods. Wow. Wow. <laughs> I mean, what a story you have and what information you are coming back and sharing with all of us. It's very incredible. <laughs> I know as well that it has, as you said, it's given you these abilities now to not only remember who you are, but help all of us to remember who we really are. Mm -hmm. And that's what I want to talk about in part two, because I know you have some information about what we can expect in the future. Sounds good. All right. We'll see you on the other side. <laughs> okay. I hope you enjoyed Franco as much as I did. It was such a treat to talk to him. And I've got an interesting story to share with you um, in just a moment. But first, I want to talk about part two and show you a few clips of what you'll be hearing. But basically, we talk a lot about this transformation that's going to be taking place, this evolution that all of us are going to be going through. And what's fascinating is we're not talking about decades out. We're not talking 10 years out. We are talking about very soon. So here's a look at some of what he had to say. That we've been told that we are the body. We've been told that everything in this life is everything that is in this life. <laughs> Do it right or else you're going to go, you know, somewhere else. Okay. But that's not true. This is the, this is just the beginning. And in fact, this is not even the beginning. You've already had beginnings. You've had an, a stupid number of beginnings already. This is just one one stop in those beginnings. You are so much greater than who you are. You just have been told that you're not. And so that's a huge contrast. This 5D is coming in. And it's not going to take hundreds of years for that to happen. It's only going to take a matter of a handful of years. And in the next three, four, five years, yeah, just three, four, five years, as insane as that sounds, but it isn't really because you're already starting to see some of it starting to trickle in. 
We're going to do things. You're going to see things, hear about things that up until just a year ago wasn't possible, but now they're going to be possible. Okay, so here is the cool story. As we were chatting before we did the interview, we discovered that we were both living in the same apartment building when we were attending the University of Minnesota. So we probably passed in the hallway or maybe passed coming in and out of the entryway, maybe in the parking lot. I just find that really fascinating how our paths may have crossed a long time ago. And then who knew we're doing this podcast today. So really fun to hear that. Just fun overall. I so enjoyed talking to him and I'd love to know your thoughts. So if you would like to share in the comments, um, some of the things that you found interesting that we discussed, that would be wonderful. And as you always know, I just appreciate any kind of comment because it really makes a difference to this channel. So even if you just say made it, that is really important. And I thank you so much. I know many of you do it week after week. And you're so great about that. So just thank you so much. Also, I want to mention that if you have a friend who may enjoy this podcast, please go ahead and share this link with them or share a link to my playlist. I always have those in the description for you to share. Just click on that little word more. Also, if you like this episode, please give it a like. If you haven't subscribed, that would be great. I'd really appreciate it. Most of all, as I always say, thank you so much for being here. I am so very grateful for all of you. And I do hope that you will join me again in part two. Thanks for joining me on Beyond with Heather Tesh. Please add comments and questions you'd like future guests to answer. Also, if you liked what you heard, please hit the thumbs up button and subscribe. That'll help keep this podcast going. You can also go to Beyond with Heather Tesh to look for more episodes. 